When I was a high school English teacher, I gave an assignment based on the poetry of A.E. Hausman. And I had the students write a letter to their future selves. I would actually keep these letters for many years and then eventually send them back. And I would add in a letter from myself to the students. One year, I had a particular student write back and ask if we could connect. So we set up a call and we talked. And in this talk, she told me that when she had been my student, I had told her that she could write a book. And she was shocked by this. It had been an impossible possibility for her. She didn't think that that was something she could do. But I had said, yes, you could write a book. If you work hard, you keep writing, you could absolutely publish a book. She let me know on that same call that just in a few months later, her first book was going to be published. And, and it was a very exciting call to get. But what if I had said no? What if I had said in that moment, the very real challenges that first-time authors face, the, the difficulty it takes, to, the commitment to write a book and then find a publisher and then, you know, or self-publish, all of that. It's very real. It would have been a just as, just as uh, correct answer. But I said yes. And it really helped push her forward. So I've reflected on this in my current role as CEO of an educational nonprofit. And I have the honor to work with educators who also have yes as their default response. It's a great joy for me to work with these folks. But sadly, this isn't everywhere. This isn't the standard. This isn't the default response. Often it's no, or perhaps a guarded yes, but, <laughs> right? And nowhere is this more prevalent than the teacher's lounge, unfortunately. Now, there are exceptions, of course, and I applaud those schools that have vibrant, positive spaces for teacher's lounges. But if any of you have had, if you think back to your own times and you've wandered into a teacher's lounge, you were probably quickly shooed out uh, because this is a private space. This is their sanctum. This is where they can grade papers. This is where teachers can, can gripe, honestly, and complain probably about you um, <laughs> and look at the workload that they've got. But that is a challenge. That is the thing. And it's happened to me as well. Uh, in fact, it's so common, and I've talked to other educators about this as well, that I would recommend to colleagues to just avoid the teacher's lounge. Stay away. Eat lunch in your room or go off campus or you know, do something else. Take a walk for lunch. Don't go in the teacher's lounge because, after all, it's where good ideas go to die. It's far too true, unfortunately. Then this has happened to me myself. I actually took an idea. I was asked as a very young teacher to help write the technology plan for the school. And I was given very few parameters. So I dreamed big, very big, probably too big. But I took the ideas into the teacher's lounge and I started sharing. Oh, yes, and we can do this, and we can do this. And I always told Mike, how are we going to pay for all that? How, what if the kids lose the laptops or break the laptops? And how, who's going to train all the teachers and staff to use those devices? And I left defeated. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, 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 my, in fact, doubt had killed that dream, which happens far too often. Thankfully, there were supportive teachers, more colleagues, and a forward-thinking administrator, and a little bit of funding that came from the state called Digital High School Program, and much of that plan eventually was realized. So I was encouraged by that. But I think what we've been doing here, and my advice to avoid the teacher's lounge, that's the easy way out. And I'm done. I think we seeded that ground a bit too quickly. So what I'm calling for today is to reclaim the teacher's lounge. Let's take that teacher's lounge, transform it. Let's turn it into something positive. Let's turn it into something brand new. In fact, you could give it a name, maybe something like the Innovation Connection. <laughs> maybe you could call it the Spark Lounge, right? This is what you could do. In fact, that could be the first thing you do. You challenge your colleagues, what shall we call the teacher's lounge now that we've transformed it? That'll be a contest. Winner gets a parking spot, front row, four a month, golden. That's what you could do. You know what else you should do is set a rule. Make this space a yes and space. Not a yes but, not a no, a yes and and space. And if you aren't familiar with the yes and concept, it comes from improv and, and a little performance, if you've ever seen that. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I was very young, my parents sent me into an improv class. Oddly enough, I, I took dance, uh, I sang, they encouraged me to study magic and juggling. Uh, there was even a unicycle in the garage. So reflecting back, I think they might have been trying to convince me to go and run away with the circus. Or <laughs> at the very least, the local community theater. But I'm so glad that they did. It taught me the basic precept of this yes and philosophy. It taught me how to collaborate with a colleague, how to work together extemporaneously, which is so very valuable 
in this space that I'm describing, this yes and philosophy. So what would it look like if we fully embraced a yes and philosophy in the teacher's lounge? Could it look like, yes, using Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire to teach 20th century history is a great idea, and why, why don't you work with the middle school students and make it a multi-age project? Yes, having a 5K run to raise money to, to support the programs that we want to do at our school is a great idea. And why don't you invite a teacher band, perhaps, to play and entertain the folks that are there? That would be fabulous. Yes, and, yes, and, imagine it. Once you open the door to that, lots of things can happen. You could have a teacher karaoke day. <laughs> I've seen it. They can rip. You could have a lip sync contest. All sorts of things open up. And the thing that I also would embrace in this space is the idea that the best teachers are lifelong learners. And it embrace, I think it's embodied best in this Native American proverb, that he who learns from one who is learning drinks from a flowing river. I've embraced it myself. It's a personal and professional uh, philosophy. We actually at Q, we don't refer to our, our, our folks that do sessions as trainers or presenters. We, we refer to them as lead learners because after all, you're, you, if you're learning, it's the best possible way to teach. So that concept, I would embrace that in this newly transformed teacher's lounge. A lot of other things could happen as well. You could find face places where folks could collaborate and use their love, you know, share their passion and their love and have that be part of what they teach their students. This yes and philosophy. And there's one other story I want to tell you. One of my dear friends, an educator, a lifelong learner, Carol Ann McGuire. She's a teacher and she was at a conference learning. She went to a session that interested her about the California Student Media Festival. And she saw the presenter, Hall Davidson, up on stage, sharing student creativity with the video projects, talking about the winners, talking about how to enter. And she got inspired. She got fired up. Back to school on Monday, she tells her students, hey, kids, I had the great idea. We're going to make a movie. We're going to make the movie. We're going to build it. We're going to edit it. We're going to publish it. We're going to submit it to this contest, the California Student Media Festival. And the kids get all excited. Oh, yeah, we'll totally do that. That's a great idea. Okay, who's going to write? Who's going to shoot? They start working out this plan. They start figuring it. Then the bell rings. Where does Carol Ann go? The teacher's lounge. She walks in the teacher's lounge, shares her enthusiasm for this great new idea, talks about the session she went to, talks about the kids' reaction, and her colleagues are a little bit concerned. You see, the thing I didn't mention until now is that she was a teacher at the time of blind and visually impaired students. And they reminded her that that might not be the best project for them. And she agreed. She said, oh, you're right. Of course, what was I thinking? And she took the long walk back to the classroom after lunch and had to break the news to the kids that, sorry, we, we can't do that. I forgot. We just can't do that. And they said, no, we're going to make the movie, Mrs. McGuire. We could totally do it. And we already figured it out. Who's going to do what? And so she said, well, let me think about it. Let me think about it. She reached out. She reached out to a network, a virtual teacher's lounge, if you will. She knew a number of folks that were Apple Distinguished Educators. And in this community, yes and is the default. And they said, yes, you can do it with your students. We'll help. We'll figure out ways. You can do it. And so she went back the next morning. She goes, all right, we're going to do this. They made the movie. They worked on it. They submitted it for the festival. And the next year, they got up and they accepted the award. But Carol Ann didn't stop there. She kept going. She got inspired again. And she created a program called Rock Our World. And Rock Our World was built on the idea that you could use software to connect classrooms all over the world. And she connected eight classrooms at a time to create a song using Apple's GarageBand software. And the, software, the, the song would move around the world. Each classroom would add a track. And at the end, you would have eight unique songs created by eight unique classrooms from eight different parts of the world. And if you don't mind, I'd like to show you a little clip of what that looks like. They worked with the band Petrie to make a music video. So join in with me singing, so join in with me singing, singing around. So join in with us singing, so join in with us singing, singing around. All over and around the world, world there's a mood that is hard to love. In love. Australia. Wisconsin, very exotic. Tennessee. Israel.
let's have a round for Carol Ann McGuire and her students. That's the kind of inspiring movement. That's what I'm talking about in this newly designed teacher's lounge. So my challenge to you, if you're an educator, if you are a professor, if you're an administrator, reclaim your teacher's lounge. Go forth, collaborate, work with each other. Reach out to local industry, find sponsors or funding to buy new furniture that supports open learning environments. Put it in the teacher's lounge, give it a new name, and then challenge each other to be positive, collaborative, and embrace those yes and and lead learner philosophies. And if you're not a, an educator, if you're a parent, if you're a community member or a student, find your local schools, find an educator, find some school that you can help them find the resources to reclaim that teacher's lounge. And this is the most important. Once you've done that, share the story. Go to social media, go to the web, and create a virtual teacher's lounge worldwide. If you do that, when a student or a child or a friend or a colleague asks you if they can write a book, you can say yes, and maybe they'll make a movie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>